All right, ladies and gentlemen, you made it to the last presentation of the day. Congratulations. I'm Al Tagge. You've seen me over the years with this conference, and we're going to go through, as we've entitled this slide, New Avenues for HIV Treatment and Prevention. Here's what I hope you will learn today. We're going to update a couple of, quote, recently, unquote, approved products. Um, in addition, we will be focusing on some new classes of medication, capsid inhibitors and NRTTI, nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors. In addition, we'll briefly mention things on the horizon, broadly neutralizing antibodies, a long acting NNRTI, and perhaps some new sites for integrase inhibitors. We can't launch into any of these talks without bringing up the viral life cycle, which you all know well. Depicted here in the cartoon, of course, is the HIV virus coming to the CD4 cell and docking with it fusing, therefore allowing entry of its capsid, which contains both prepackaged enzymes as well as its RNA. The RNA is converted to DNA, transported to the nucleus, where it is integrated into the host DNA. Thereafter, transcription of the DNA, which has been integrated, is carried out by the host machinery, producing new polyproteins for the virus, which are cleaved in the cytoplasm and subsequently packaged into a new capsid and then budded from the cell surface. We have now available to us medications which work at basically every site in this life cycle. And well, I guess I didn't get this to come up quite right, but what you'll see here are the numerous sites of action of the medications we have available, but we will focus today on those that are in the red boxes with the asterisk next to them, namely attachment inhibitors, the new capsid inhibitors, the NRTTI, reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors, as well as maturation inhibitors. <clears throat> we'll start off talking about abilizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody approved in 2018. It is a post-attachment inhibitor, which docks after the HIV virus has itself attached to the co-receptor. It is believed to act somewhere in this region, but the exact mechanism of action is not quite known at this time. Importantly, and the reason for bringing this up is it acts at a similar site as another drug that we'll talk about later. This was designed for experienced, highly treatment-resistant patients. It requires IV loading dose and then Q2 weekly infusion. Ideally, you want to have a minimum of one and preferably two other active drugs in the background regimen. It does not have any known drug-drug interactions, renal issues, or cross-resistance with other classes of medications. It has been well tolerated in its clinical experience to date. And in addition, even though it is working at the site of the CD4 receptors and cell, it does not have immune suppression. Resistance occurs through alterations of GP120 sites on the V5 glucan of the HIV envelope. This area is prone to significant diversity and mutation. This product, while effective, is costly. We'll move on then to Duravarine, which also has been in use for over the last three years and is brought up again because of future discussions. This is an NNRTI that works at the typical site and therefore interrupting DNA polymerase. It's a 100 milligram once daily oral dosing, which was designed to overcome some of the problems of the previous medications in this class, namely low barrier to resistant neuropsychiatric side effects and lipid abnormalities. It is metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme, but it is not itself an inducer or an inhibitor. It is not affected by food or acid blocking agents. And as mentioned, it has a favorable lipid profile, which I'll show you. It does have activity against the common NNRTI mutations, which are listed here. 
it most commonly selects for the V106 mutation, but it requires more than one mutation typically to develop resistance. Therefore, combinations of mutations are required. It has a significantly lower incidence of neuropsychiatric side effects compared to efavirenz, and it's overall well tolerated with an adverse event discontinuation rate of only 2.8%. These are the two main trials associated with this compound. And in these trials, Doravirine was compared to boosted darunavir and efavirenz. And you can see that all three drugs had excellent viral suppression with 80% or higher. These trials were published in CID 2020 issue listed below. In addition, excellent CD4 count increases were obtained by all three compounds of nearly 200 cells at the 48 week mark. As I mentioned previously, the lipid profile is quite favorable. Doravirine is depicted in the dark gray. The two comparators are in the lighter colored bars and you can see that there were some slight decreases in all classes of adverse lipids with Doravirine and a slight boost in the HDL numbers. So overall a favorable lipid profile. What I'm showing here will be two slides, one containing the Stanford mutation database, the other the IAS. In the Stanford database, mutations in bold red are associated with the highest levels of reduced susceptibility. Mutations in bold i.e. black bone reduced in our susceptibility or the virologic response and mutations in plain text have some degree of reduced susceptibility. What is important to note here is that as you look across Doravirine, there are no bold mutation. And again, V106 is the most common. It has been known to show up with efavirenz as well as nevirapine, neither of which is in use an extensive basis at this time, but there can be background resistance that exists. These mutations, excuse me, this mutation was not commonly associated with either compound. And then to look at the IAS, data, IAS database, Doravirine again, you'll see the V106, and you can see that this shows up as noted with Favrins and Doravirine. Also, the Y188 is bolded here. Now, once again, this does not mean absolute resistance to this drug, but decreased susceptibility, particularly in combination with other mutations. The Y188 does show up with efavirenz, nevirapine, and ropivirine, but again, is not a common mutation for this compound. <clears throat> The study was done in Europe, combining with French and Italian databases, <clears throat> excuse me, looking for Doravirine associated mutations in experienced patients. What you see here in the upper panel is the combined database from the ANRS, and in the lower database, the Stanford mutations. The dark bars represent all genotypes that were studied, the light colored bars, those with NNRTI failing regimens. And if you look at the overall picture in the ANRS database, there were a small number of Doravirine associated mutations in the dark bar. But in the light bar, there were 18% incidents of mutations associated with Doravirine in NNRTI failing regimens. This does not mean these individual mutations would cause resistance, but were associated with resistance. However, when you compare this to the database from Stanford, 
in the overall genotyping, nearly 18% demonstrated or aberrant associated mutation. And in the NNRTI failing regimens, it was 42%. Again, I emphasize that the mutations in and of themselves do not signify resistance, but for duraverine, it requires combinations. So it is important to know the background genotypic information on your patients. Overall, though, in looking at this, despite the numbers of mutations that show up, it is significantly lower in duraverine than in the other compounds. So let's move on to newer agent, Fostemzavir, which was approved last year in July at the height of the wonderful COVID pandemic, which we're all still going through and experiencing another spike. Fostemzavir is the prodrug of Temzavir, which is the active compound. It is an attachment inhibitor and binds to the HIV envelope GP120, as you'll see here. This is where Temzavir binds. Recall when we talked about ivalizumab that it seems to have its focus of activity somewhere here. So these two drugs work on a similar aspect of the HIV, but so far have not had demonstrated cross resistance. Resistance is being defined, but is not yet commercially available for us to use in clinical practice. The mutations are listed here. And again, I emphasize these mutations have not been linked to ibolizumab or to the CCR5 inhibitor Maraviron. Again, I will state that substantial diversity exists at the GP120 site. And this area has mutations that occur. So susceptibilities were broadly variable at baseline for Merck plus Temzavir when it was studied. And going on with this drug, it is an oral BI drug, the, excuse me, oral BID drug with a long half-life of 11 hours. Overall had good tolerance. There was a 10% incidence of nausea associated with minor headache and diarrhea and rash. It is a minor substrate of cytochrome P3A, so avoid 3A inducers and be cautious, particularly with rifampin, and you may have some effect here with some of the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. It is not affected by stomach acid weight, renal or hepatic insufficiency, but cannot be crushed, so therefore cannot be placed down in NG2. Oops. The BRIGHT study was the registration study for this drug. Note that these patients were highly experienced with 85% having five or more previous regimens and 86% had AIDS. There were basically two arms to this. <clears throat> Initially, Fostemzavir was added for eight days to the failing regimen and then compared to the failing regimen. Subsequently, Fostemzavir was added to an optimized background for these patients. And then there was also a non-randomized regimen which had no active available drugs remaining. Thus essentially, Fostemzavir monotherapy with an optimized background. And this was studied then over 48 and 92 weeks. This is a busy slide with small print, so look carefully and I'll point out the important details. If we go to the upper panel, we study the randomized cohort on the left and the non-randomized cohort on the right. And what we're looking at is viral load suppression below 40 copies and below 200 copies. So for the randomized cohort, 84% made it to less than 200 and 62% to less than 40 copies. In the non-randomized cohort, 54% less than 200 and 48% less than 40 copies. If we look at CD4 count increase in the lower panel, you'll see that in the randomized or active arm, there were 139 new CD4 cells, which is quite remarkable. 
or a highly treatment experienced advanced population. And in addition, even in the failing cohort, cohort 64 cell increase was noted. This whole issue with increase in CD4 has been pointed out as potentially a real benefit for this drug. This just shows the results of the viral load suppression um, in copies of less than 200 and less than 40 for the randomized and non-randomized cohorts. 18% in the randomized and 51% of the non-randomized cohort develop resistance. Less than one half of that randomized cohort had mutations identified to explain the resistance. Furthermore, treatment led to suppression in almost half of this group in ongoing study. So there are some issues here to try to understand about activity of this drug as well as how resistance can develop. And perhaps we're going to learn more about other resistance mutations or other issues about this compound. But overall, we have another new medication for multi-drug resistant patients, which is an oral agent. Although given BID, this is a group of patients that frequently has had to use BID drugs in the past and may be accustomed to this and consequently, probably not a major issue, at least in my opinion. So let's move on to some new horizons. <clears throat> Perhaps this is truly the dawning of a new age of HIV treatment with the injectable drugs. I would say this with tongue in cheek as there may be a few hurdles here which we have to overcome and we'll go through those. It's critical to understand some nuances in these studies, and thus we'll spend some time in this area. The FDA approved this drug for treatment of HIV naive patients in January of this year, and perhaps it'll be approved for PrEP next year. There is an oral lead-in period, period that then leads to a maintenance period of monthly injections. Currently, it is on a monthly basis, but it could become two monthly based upon the ATLAS 2M study. There are some logistic issues with a window of opportunity for the injection to be given, as well as refrigeration, rewarming of the drugs in the department. Approval of third party payers has also been somewhat of a challenge so far, and this is echoed by others. It may offer convenience to a patient who wishes to avoid disclosure of status, as well as assist those who have swallowing issues or absorption issues. There are, as I alluded to, some questions to be answered yet. This is the FLARE study, and we'll walk through the study protocol. It was a phase three, still ongoing, and we're reporting data now at week 128. There was a 24, excuse me, a 20-week induction phase with belatagavir, abacavir, and 3TC. This then went on to be the comparator arm, as opposed to going on to the active investigation with oral cubitagravir for four weeks with rupivirine, and then the injection phase thereafter. Keep in mind there is no coverage for hepatitis B, so they should not be included in this group of patients. This data is only updated from previously reported data. So you'll see that there was a slight decrease in suppression of less than 50 copies in the bar graphs on the right. But most patients without virologic data at week 124 were due to adverse events or no virologic reasons. At week 124, there were five additional patients who had HIV viral loads greater than 50. There was one confirmed failure and this patient had two integrase RAMs, the N155 and the R263. The safety profile continued to be good and compared favorably to week 96. So thus far, five of eight with failure and integrase mutations had good plasma levels of drug. 
this is the subject of further study to try to further understand what may have gone wrong here. Therefore, we believe we need to track additional long-term data for complete understanding of the risk-benefit ratio. In the ATLAS 2M study, two-thirds of failures were found to have a pivoting archive resistance. So another necessity of caution. Moving on to looking at cabotegravir alone as PrEP, there were two studies initiated, HPTN 083 and 084. 083 was in MSM and transgender women, 084 in cisgender women, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a phase three study, and the DSMB recommended early termination of both arms due to endpoints of CRU. Superiority was demonstrated for the injectable drug. And we'll see here on the left, the MSM transgender group, and on the right, the cisgender group. Both agents were highly effective, but there is obvious differences in the arms. In the MSM group, 083 on the left, there were 12 infections in the oral, excuse me, in the carbotegravir injectable arm and 39 in the daily oral treatment arm. In the 084 group on the right, there were four in the injectable group and 34 in the oral arm. These studies are published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I urge you to read through this carefully as well as the editorial that accompanies it. In looking at 084 and in the cisgender women, there were four who had a prolonged period between an injection. Instead of eight weeks, it was 16 weeks, and all of these developed HIV infection. They were subsequently treated with a regimen of dolotegravir, 3TC, and TDF with success. So most of these infections occurred in the setting of low drug levels. It was also noted that cabotegravir may delay HIV detection if you are using a standard point of care assay. So in looking at resistance in 083 and 084, in the oral arm with TDF-FTC, adherence issues were likely the culprit. We know that this combination is 99% efficacious if taken on a daily oral basis. And the carbotegravir arm, delayed injections were likely the result of the infections that occurred. Other possibilities may be low absorption, low concentration in rectal tissue, rectal inflammation, or some combination of the above. Baseline resistance testing needs to be carried out for use. Some integrase resistance did occur in the oral lead-in phase of cabotegravir. Therefore, once again, adherence played a role. However, again, four integrase resistance cases occurred with apparent good level without obvious explanation at this point. The tail phase of cabotegravir, once it was discontinued, did not appear to play a role. In addition, there were significant numbers of STIs in this population with 13 per 100 person years of gonorrhea, 21 person per 100 person years of chlamydia, and 17 per 100 person years of syphilis. So significant amount of active STIs. And again, this is published and I urge you to review. <clears throat> this study again looks at the prevalence of baseline virologic factors associated with the risk for virologic failure, cabotegravir, and ropivirine. This was a retrospective analysis. This is a little harder for us to keep in mind for our population in this country. All of these patients were naive, but only 39% were HIV subtype B. The real issue here is that cabotegravir mutations were detected in 16% at baseline. 
it was higher in non-B than B subtype. But overall, frank resistance to carbotegravir was only predicted in 0.7%. So ofevirine resistance mutations were detected in 14%, and resistance predicted in only 6%. And these were mostly non-subtype B. So the risk factors were predominantly non-subtype B, but one baseline risk factor for virologic failure for both drugs was detected in 10.1%. And both E138 and integrase L74 polymorphisms were, however, detected in only 0.4%. So basically, there was a low risk of resistance to both drugs at baseline. However, if you pick up the rapivirine mutation, you're then treating with single agent drug. So a word of caution, although it looks like it may be a low risk, we need to know baseline mutations. This study is a little bit more complex, so I'll just give you the highlights without dragging you through a lot of details. This was in Italy from a database and they looked at patients switching from three drugs to a dual ropivirine-based regimen. This was an attempt to switch patients who were treatment experienced. Some were fully suppressed, some were not fully suppressed. And as you might guess, varying degrees of success were met, particularly in those who were not fully suppressed. The bottom line was virologic failure at the time of switch and the presence of baseline NNRTI resistance mutations were independent predictors of virologic failure switched to pivoting dual base therapy. The bottom line is get the patient suppressed and know the treatment history and previous resistance mutations. So in addition, this is a post hoc analysis of three studies particularly ATLAS, FLARE, and ATLAS 2M, looking at factors that might predict resistance to this combination. <clears throat> and they found in the red box, a BMI greater than 30 had an increased but somewhat low risk, baseline HIV subtype being not B, which we may see more of in this country with immigrants. Rapivirine associated mutations was the big one. And then a lack of eight week rapivirine adequate trough concentrations. The Q8 weekly dosing was not a factor. And in the right hand table, you'll see if there are no baseline factors, one baseline factor, or two baseline factors, and the, resist, the risk of resistance to this combination. Two baseline factors from that red box leads to a perhaps 26% risk of failure. This very busy slide only wishes to express to us the virologic failure associated with this combination frequently selects for two class resistance, namely both NNRTI and integrase. So we need to be careful with this therapy. If we look at the IAS table for integrase mutations associated with carbotegravir, which is depicted in the purple box, you'll see that it can select for multiple mutations that have cross resistance with the other compounds in this class. So we must be certain that we're not impacting the integrase class, as in recent years, this has become our go-to for many reasons and is now the most widely used class of medication. This was a study from eight sites in the United States looking at concerns about integrating this therapy into the clinics. And despite some significant early reservations, overall, it was found to be very workable with some minor barriers persisting. 
some of the changes that had to be made were shown on the right hand side. Extended clinic hours were utilized. There was incre increased coordination with other departments for the care of the patients. They had to acquire new refrigeration and additional space. Implementation eased was mitigated by the, excuse me, implementation ease was mitigated by concerns regarding the leadership support, which really came through. They had to establish a good track and reminder system to get these patients in on time. The wait times because of all the changes were decreased, which led to increased patient and, and provider satisfaction. And overall, there was really quite significant acceptance by the patients. So overall, it can be workable with some effort. There's still significant interest as was noted in this PrEP study in the United States. We'll focus on the four bottom white boxes, which I'll read to you because they're probably too small for you to see carefully. Of current PrEP users who were not adherent, 96% were interested in injectable PrEP. Of the current PrEP users who were adherent, 84% thought they might be interested in switching. Of those who never used PrEP but were daily PrEP willing, 79% expressed interest in injectable form. And of those who never used PrEP and were not interested previously, 45% expressed interest. So overall, it appears that there could be some increased acceptance of PrEP, which is a necessity if we hope to get this pandemic under control. So now we'll move on to some new targets and new medications. Is Latrovir is the NRTTI, which I had mentioned previously, Lenacapavir is the capsid inhibitor, and we'll briefly mention some thoughts on broadly neutralizing antibodies toward the end of the talk. Is Latrovir, as noted, is the NRTTI, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. It has a unique resistance profile that, although seems related to the NRTI class, does not have NRTI cross resistance as currently understood. It has a very long oral half-life of 190 hours with the oral formulation. It works by translocation inhibition as well as delayed chain termination of RNA being converted to DNA. This is being looked at as a PrEP formulation current. PrEP, as we have mentioned, is an oral daily fixed dose combination, which requires oral daily adherence, which has been an issue. Currently, this is looking at a once monthly oral tablet and a once yearly subdermal implant, which both could be significant improvements over what we have available. So looking at the once monthly oral tablet for PrEP, this was a dose ranging kinetic study with two doses of Vizlatrovir, 60 milligrams and 120 compared to placebo. There was a broad range of age, um, patients included in this trial and a significant number of females and minority patients, although small numbers. What was found is that both doses were very well tolerated. 92% completed the trial. Safety outcomes were great with really minimal side effects. There were no confirmed HIV infections throughout the treatment period. And it was noted that the concentration of this compound inside peripheral blood mononuclear cells was still above the pre-specified PK threshold at eight weeks. Therefore, it truly does have a long duration of action. This is also being looked at as an implantable eluding compound for yearly use. 
and I state yearly, quite incredible. All this shows you is that the drug in this formulation will last with adequate levels. Here is the PK threshold. This is the level at 48 weeks. So the level is adequate for this purpose. Now you'll note this was the reason that I brought up Doravirine earlier. Here Doravirine is being combined with his Latrovir in a trial, which is again, somewhat of a dose ranging trial with a comparator arm. And I'll quickly walk you through the setup. There are three doses of his Latrovir here, which all are initially given with Doravirine 3 TC for 24 weeks. And then we move on to just as Latrovir and Doravirine with the various dosing. The comparator arm was Doravirine 3TC and TDF throughout the study period. Safety issues were very positive overall. Headache was most common in the Latrovir Doravirine arm, but still relatively low compared to the comparator. Diarrhea was interestingly more common in the Doravirine 3TC TDF arm. Weight changes were comparable in both arms. Uh, hip and bind bone mineral density changes were shown to be favorable in the Latrovir arm compared to the TDF arm, which is not surprising. There were slight increases in HDL as well as LDL cholesterol in the Islatrovir Duravirine arm. So we'll move on now and talk about lenacapavir, the capsid inhibitor, which again has a unique profile compared to other compounds. It too has a very long half-life, both sub-Q and orally. You recall the HIV capsid is contained within the glycoprotein envelope. It is brought to the surface, released into the cytoplasm, where it then releases its contents, which are the prepackaged enzymes and RNA, and then goes on through the nucleus, where the RNA is converted into DNA and integrated, and subsequently. The capsid is reformulated after the polyprotein is cleaved and then butted off as a new viral pro product. Here we see that there are various sites of action for lenacapavir. It appears to interfere with disassembly as well as nuclear transport, and then also interferes with viral production. So it is unique in its multi-site activity. This is a complex study of naive patients with lenacapavir-based treatment. Small numbers in each arm. You'll see that the upper two arms were sub-Q lenacapavir, the lower two arms had, excuse me, one lower, lower arm had lenacapavir. Initially combined with FTC TAF daily oral, and then only TAF long term. This arm of Q6 monthly injectable in a capravir initially combined with FTC TAF, but then completed with bistegravir. These two arms remain the same throughout, excuse me, this arm with FTC TAF long term, and then the comparator was bistegravir. FTC and TAF. This was a relatively young population with a high rate of minority included. The modest median viral load is noted, but there were a fair number with viral loads over 100. CD4 count was relatively well preserved being in the 400s as a median and no one with a CD4 count less than 300 in this trial. The virologic outcomes were excellent in all arms with greater than 90% being suppressed. Um, I think really this speaks well for the compound as well as the comparator arm. 
Um, you can see this depicted in bar graphs here as well as in the line graph. In this particular study, there was only one emergent mutation and lenacapavir failure. It was felt that this patient may not have been taking the oral component well in the regimen. This may have led to his failure. However, he was able to be resuppressed with a somewhat complicated regimen of BID, AZT, 3TC, and then a daily TDF and dolotegravir. So he could be suppressed, although it required some extra effort. Safety and tolerability were excellent. Um, overall, there were not any significant adverse events. There were, as expected, injection site reactions. Most of these were minor, but I will point out to you to take note that there were nodules and in induration that persisted for a median of 189 and 143 days. A little bit of deja vu of T20 and Enfruvertide. However, this led to a very low rate of discontinuation. The Capella study is looking at lenacapavir in heavily treatment experienced patients. It's a little bit of a complicated design, but initially for 14 days, lenacapavir was added to the failing regimen. Then a group was taken from this where it was added to lenacapavir in an optimized background. The failing regimen was continued as noted here, and this was then converted to lenacapavir and an optimized background. There was also a non-randomized cohort of patients who were then just placed with oral lenacapavir. And these had very low number or zero adequate active compounds. You'll note that study requirements were that there was resistance to two or more agents from three or four of the classes of existing compounds. The age group here was quite typical of highly treatment experienced patients being somewhat older. There was female representation, although not robust, in a significant minority population. If you look on the bottom of the slide, you'll see that there's a great deal of resistance present here, particularly to the NRTI and NNRTI class. The most likely classes that still had some activity with, of course, boosted protease and integrase drugs. On the left, you'll see depiction of the viral load results. On the right, we'll talk about viral load suppression based upon fully number of active agents in the optimized background. Overall, lenacapavir led to high rates of suppression in this population. The viral load suppression on the left by FDA snapshot algorithm was 81% less than 50 copies with 19% greater than 50 and less than 289%. If we focus on the right-hand side, if there were zero active agents in the optimized background, there was still 67% who had less than 50 copies, quite remarkable. If there was one, 81%. And if there were two active agents, 81%. So keep in mind though, however, we're dealing with relatively small numbers in this population. But I think what this tells us is that we have the potential for another very active compound that we may have soon available to us. Resistance did emerge in a few people in this study. 
and there were four that had documented resistance and the mutations are in the left-hand box. All four participants with emergent resistance remained on lenacaprovir. Three were resuppressed at a later point, one with an optimized background change and two with no change at all. One participant, however, had no fully active agents and could not be suppressed, unfortunately. They remained with a low viral load. Interestingly, throughout the ongoing study observation, no additional resistance um, was noted to develop. Again, the safety profile for this compound in this population of highly treatment experienced was similar to what we saw previously. And again, there was an incidence of nodules and in induration, which is noted. But it was well tolerated that, and no adverse events led to discontinuation in this particular study. So we have a highly effective potent compound. This appears to be well tolerated. It can be given both orally as well as sub Q, perhaps on a very prolonged basis. And what we see here are mutants that were selected by lenacaprovir and then tested against our commonly used compounds, tenofovir, efavirenz, and deltategravir. And what this shows you that the mutations selected for by lenacapavir do not cross-react and remain fully susceptible to the other compounds, thus safe without cross-resistance. There's a current study ongoing for lenacapavir for PrEP on a Q6 monthly basis. This only is intended to introduce you to the concept and not the details of the study. There's also evidence as a long acting inhibitor in PrEP for vaginal use in the SHIV model. And all this does is show us that it is feasible. You'll see in the left-hand panel, placebo, 150 milligram dose and 300 milligram dose. And what you'll find is that the 300 milligram dose was active and fully protective over the course of 20 weeks in this study population of animals. So what do we have out on the horizon? Well, there are several compounds that are forthcoming. The first that I'll mention is the maturation inhibitor from GSK. If you are old enough to recall, there was an attempt to develop a compound called Biviramat in the past. This unfortunately was shown to have multiple polymorphisms at baseline that caused resistance. In addition, BMS had developed a maturation inhibitor, unfortunately, they're poor GI tolerance. This compound appears to have much better GI tolerance. So hopefully this can move on through studies and found to be effective and well tolerated and come into clinical use. Broadly neutralizing antibodies have come of interest and one in particular, lipivomab, and hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And there are two other compounds. Target the GP120 and GP41. This has the potential to eliminate infected CD4 cells, which of course will show on the surface the GP120. This could target the reservoir and be a significant improvement in our efforts to obtain a cure. These compounds, however, appear to work best earlier rather than in chronic infection, particularly the FEBIG class one through four. The Zetolimab is a toll-like receptor seven agonist, which can activate innate and cell-mediated immunity 
which can then be utilized to fight HIV. This is currently undergoing studies by Gilead Sciences. An additional monoclonal antibody is Neuronalem, excuse me, Neuronalumab. And VCR1 is an additional monoclonal antibody looked at in terms of PrEP. There's an additional NNRTI under investigation, which could be long acting. And integrase sites are being looked at for new focuses of activity for long acting oral and injectable drugs. Furthermore, there's ongoing discussion between Merck and Gilead in a collaboration to combine is Latrovir and Lenacapavir, which could be extremely important. There is work on an annual implant of CAF FTC and more things to come. So we truly are entering into an exciting time with many new compounds coming forward for treatment, prevention, and perhaps elimination of the reservoir of HIV infection. So thank you for your attention and we'll try to answer questions if you have them.